Amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're in two places this morning, John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 5, and 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. <clears throat> now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to continue to worship you in the Word. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, and our ears to comprehend what you would have us comprehend. Lord, take these humble words and turn them into the message that you need us to hear. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, it is week uh, two of our series, We Believe. If you'll remember last week, I talked about the idea that um, when you're watching a series uh, uh, on TV, on Netflix or something like that, you get about season three and they, they go back and they do, start to do the backstory of the characters so that you kind of have a better understanding. And so this is, this is our Christian faith backstory. These are the foundational truths that we are building uh, our faith upon. And these are what we call our non-negotiables. Last week, we talked about the Trinity and I dug into the the creeds and how the creeds kind of shape us and mold us. And what we need to understand is that the creeds are kind of a safety rail for us, if you will. Uh, Have you ever, anybody ever been bowling and you're so bad they put the little bumper rails down the side? That's what they do for me whenever I go bowling. Uh, And uh, so it's kind of our bumper rails, if you will, for us. The creeds keep us from going out of bounds, if you will. Uh, They don't replace the encounter that we have with Christ and the Holy Spirit in our new birth. That's the thing that empowers us and empowers the church and brings salvation to us. But it is the creeds that that keep us moving in a right direction and make sure we don't step over the bounds. Faith requires both two things, a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. And those have to come together to meet, to uh, play out our faith. If we simply went with the creeds, that would put us into kind of a legalistic set of rules kind of understanding of our faith. Um, And if we solely relied on our experience of the Holy Spirit, then that would tend to put us in a place where we might begin to create God in our own image and, and turn God toward us. So we use the two in perfect balance to keep us on the, the right path to Christ. So today we are going to move into two topics, the incarnation of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And quite honestly, I could spend about two weeks on each of those subjects. But for you, Reader's Digest version. Today we're going to cram two topics into this short amount of time. If we think about the the word incarnation, uh, Merriam-Webster defines incarnation as to such as to give bodily form and substance to. So when we say that Christ is is incarnate God, what we're saying is God took bodily form in Christ. Now, I hope you brought your booklet with you. We're going to use these every week. We're on page 20, if you would open that up with me. And the reason we print these for you is these are our bylaws. These are our doctrines, as you will. These are the things that, that you as a church have put together and that we stand on as our foundation. And so we're on page 20. We're on article 2. And the title of that is of the word or son of God who was made very man. If you have your book, would you read along with me out loud? The son who is the word of the father, the very and eternal God of one substance with the father took man's nature in the womb of the blessed virgin so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say the Godhead and manhood were joined together in one person, never to be divided, whereof is one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, was crucified, dead and buried, 
to reconcile his father to us and to be a sacrifice not only for original guilt but also for actual sins of man. So that's our core belief on the incarnation. <clears throat> the doctrine of incarnation teaches that the entire nature and the work of God took on the human form in the person of Jesus. Jesus was at the same time fully human and fully divine. This is the first prerequisite doctrine of the Christian faith. Without it, the rest of the doctrines fold like a deck of cards. <clears throat> it is vitally important to who we are. Now, the word incarnation doesn't appear in the New Testament. We can't find it anywhere written out, but the concept and the idea is interwoven throughout Scripture. A couple places, our text today, and the word became flesh, lived among us. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 talks about how God reveals, speaks, and creates through Jesus, and Jesus is the exact imprint of God. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Jesus, though in the form of and equal with God, took on human form, even to the point of death. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 19 tells us in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So those are just a few. There are others, but the, the idea of the incarnation is woven throughout Scripture. In the early church, there were many heresies that arose about the nature of Christ, and many of those actually still live on today. The, the heresies are out there. You see pastors standing in pulpits who talk about Christ was a good teacher, he was a good man, he was obviously a prophet, but they fall short of saying that Christ is God. Now, probably one of the biggest heretics in Christian history, uh, Nestorius, he was actually consecrated as a bishop of Constantinople in 428 A.D., he had profound repercussions for the church because he taught, actually, that Mary only gave birth to Jesus' human nature and not uh, that she should be called the mother of God. And so the idea was, in essence, he was maintaining that Jesus was two separate persons and that only the human Jesus was in Mary's womb. Now, we know that's not true, right? We know that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she uh, bore the Son of God. In essence... The stories argued that the Godhead joined with the human rather as if a man entered into a tent or put on clothes. So in essence, they're saying that Jesus was born a man and then put on God. Nope, that's right. It's not good. Now, Cyril of Alexandria gives us some insight into this. His contention is that in the incarnation, two natures come together with one another without confusion or changing each other. He says it's an indivisible union. He then makes the following important statement. He says, the flesh is flesh and not Godhead, even though it became the flesh of God. And similarly, the word is God and not flesh, even if it made the flesh his very own in the economy. Given that we understand this, we do no harm to that concurrence into union when we say that it took place out of two natures. He says, after the union has occurred, however, we do not divide the natures one from the other, nor do we sever the one and indivisible into two sons, but we say that there is one son, and the Holy Fathers have stated one incarnate nature of the word. <clears throat> and so he's digging into this idea that it is one God, one man together. Uh, he says, Two united natures, one Christ, one Son and Lord, one Word of God, made man and made flesh. Clear as mud, right? Probably like the, like the Trin understanding the Trinity. We have to understand, we learned last week, God's ways are higher than our ways. It's something we're not going to understand. I often hear people say, um, you know, here's a hard question. What's this going to be like? And I want to understand it now. We're not going to understand until we get in the gates. But I can tell you this, when you get in the gates, it's going to be the last thing on your mind. You're going to say, hold up, Jesus, I can't hug you. I need to find out how this really worked back in the day. <laughs> it's not how it's going to go down. Well, Leo the Great, he's the Pope of Rome. In 449, he kind of wrote this, this stunning letter. Here's just a snippet of it. He said, God the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he states, for by these three statements and strategies of almost all heretics are overthrown. 
those three statements will throw just about every heretical statement out. He says, for Christ was born of God of God, almighty of almighty, co-eternal of eternal, not later in time, not inferior in power, not different in glory, not divine in essence, the same only begotten eternal son of the eternal father was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He wraps up, the Son of God therefore came down from his throne in heaven without withdrawing from his Father's glory. From his mother's womb, the Lord took nature, not sin, and each nature performs its proper functions in the communion with the other. The Word performs what pertains to the Word. The Word performs what pertains to the Word, and the flesh what pertains to the flesh. It's hard to comprehend, but it's important. We have to understand this. Jesus, if Jesus was not God, then friends, we would have no salvation. This would not be a faith. There would be no reason to be here today. But because Jesus is God, it changes everything for us. Because Jesus is God, it changes everything. Say that with me. Because Jesus is God, it changes everything. Amen. Now, our John text tells us all we need to know about who Jesus is, and it affirms the divinity of Christ. Verse 1 of our text, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. If you want to know who someone is, you simply listen to their words, right? Sometimes we act and do things that that are contrary, but our words always show who we are. Jesus is called the Word because He reveals the heart and mind of God. And He does it in a couple different manners. First, He is the eternal Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and God was, and was with God. Jesus has always been and always will be God. From the beginning to the end. Part of that trinity. <clears throat> the second thing, Jesus is also the creative Word. Verse 3 says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. God created the world through his words, and God said, let there be light. Spoken word. There is power in the spoken word. You see, our words can build up or our words can destroy. We have the choice to use those words in that way. <clears throat> There's a, uh, it is our words that, that hurt others, but it's also our words that heal and mend others. Um, You know, they they say the sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. Um, I have seen some people damaged by words. You've probably been damaged by words too. More more substantial pain than a healing wound, right? Consider this short poem entitled Power of Words. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreak a life, wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. God simply spoke and the world was created. Jesus being the Word of God is a powerful reminder that He was with God in the beginning and He speaks for God now. We also know that the Greek phrase was made is the perfect tense, meaning it was a completed act. God created, creation is finished. Yet we as humanity want to try to create something new, don't we? We have laboratories trying to create humanity and animals and things like that. God's already done it. We can't, we can't recreate it. It's already been done. It's, a pro- it's not a process. Creation is a finished product. Now, if we were to skip down to verse 14 of that text, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus is the incarnate word. He was not a phantom spirit. He, was, he, was, he ministered here on this earth. He was not an illusion. The disciples all had personal experiences with Jesus that convinced them that Jesus was real 
in the flesh person. If we look at the Gospel of John, it's pointed out that Jesus was weary, John 4, 6, thirsty, John 4, 7, that he groaned within, John eleven thirty three. He openly wept, John eleven thirty five. On the cross, he thirsted, John nineteen twenty eight. He died, John nineteen thirty, and bled, John nineteen thirty four. And then, after his resurrection, he proved to his disciples of his physical body. They ate together. He had them physically touch his wounds. Those last five words of that verse fourteen. <clears throat> He was full of grace and truth. When Jesus the Christ walked the earth, he was full of God's grace and God's truth. Jesus never sugarcoated anything, did he? The gospel message is clear. We've created this image of who we believe the word of God is, and unfortunately, every individual has created Jesus kind of in our own image. We want him to look like us. We want him to act like us. We want him to, you know, we just want Jesus to be who we are. Instead, we need to be moving our own lives into the image of who Christ is and who he set forth for us to be. Grace and truth are important because they go together and they can't be separated. And when we think about grace and truth, sometimes we, living in today's society and culture, we don't like to tell the truth because it hurts people's feelings. Men, when was the last time your beautiful bride or significant other said, does this make me look fat? You have a choice on your response to that. How do you say gracefully the truth, right? Or do you lie? Don't lie. It's not good. Grace and truth are important. When our kids are young, we love them with grace and truth. We want them to know the truth, but we also want them to know about grace and love. If your kid is about to touch an open flame... You don't let them touch the open flame and learn a lesson. You stop them out of love so that they don't hurt themselves. Grace and truth together. Is it any wonder that our world is suffering from anxiety and depression as we ignore biology and science and we tell people just follow your heart? Jesus brought the fullness of God's grace and truth. He spoke for God because he was God We often hear, oh, well, Jesus never said anything about this or that. Young people, have y'all heard that? Jesus didn't speak to this issue. I've read the red letters. (laughs) If Jesus was God, with God in the beginning at creation, who do you think spoke in the Old Testament? Jesus. God has spoken on every topic there is, from Old Testament to New Testament. He brought the fullness of God. Jesus was fully God, fully human. The Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary. She gave birth to Jesus the Christ. That is a non-negotiable of our faith. The incarnation of Jesus, born via the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, fully God, fully human. All right, let's transition to the resurrection. If you've got your book, turn to page 20. We're in Article 3 of our beliefs on the resurrection of Christ. It says, Article 3, page 20, of the resurrection of Christ. Christ did truly rise again from the dead and took again his body with all things appertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven and there sitteth until he returned to judge all men at the last day. Now, we knew before Jesus came to earth that there was an argument about life after death between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees, they were the old guard. They were the the keepers of the law. They were were the the sticklers, if you will. And if you'll remember in some of the New Testament scriptures, there's those, those opportunities where they're trying to trip Jesus up talking about the resurrection and life after death. The Pharisees, they were the younger cats coming up. They were growing up and they were starting to step into who they were, right? And so they believed in the resurrection. They felt that it was true. And so there was this power struggle about the resurrection going on even before Jesus set foot foot on the earth. We know that Jesus had a physical resurrection because of the events after his resurrection where he let people touch him and engage with him. 
Remember when he showed up to the disciples that first time, right? And they're all gathered together and they're a little scared and they're a little nervous. Someone was missing. Who was missing? Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Now, could you imagine being Doubting Thomas's kid? Right? Yeah, that's my dad. Messed it all up for us all. Yeah, I know. But Thomas didn't want to believe. He wasn't there. He didn't see. So when Jesus shows up the next time and Thomas is there, Jesus is like, look, dude, come touch my hands, feel my side. And Thomas weeps. He's broken by the idea that he didn't have the faith to believe. He's like, I don't have to touch Jesus. Touch, feel, see that it's me. We know the Bible says that when Mary met Jesus in the garden, he said, do not hold on to me. Don't cling to me. So she's grasped him and hugged his physical body. He says, I have to return to the Father. Luke 24, 37 through 39, they were startled and frightened, the disciples, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. He says, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And then added proof He ate food with them. Peter said in Acts 2, 29 through 33, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. If you go to Israel, you can see the tomb. King David, been there, seen it. It's physical. It's there. That's where the body is. Bones. Verse 31, seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to that fact. The Bible documents that Jesus made a minimum of 10 bodily appearances after the resurrection. One instance, more than 500 people in that setting. History also documents the tomb empty, Friends, you can have confidence in Jesus and all of his claims because of the validity of the resurrection. It's logical and it's completely trustworthy. But hey, that's you and I telling each other about our faith, right? What does the secular world have to say about it? That's a good question. Josephus, Jewish historian, not a Christian. Do the Jews believe in Jesus? No. I mean, they think he's a good guy and everything, but they don't believe he's the son of God, the one they're looking for. Jewish historian speaks of Christ's life, miracles, death, and resurrection as a historical fact. Pagan historians, Pliny, Tactius, uh, Suetonius, they speak of Christ's death and to some degree the belief that he rose from the dead. Non-Christian witnesses cannot be ignored. Surely their record carries some weight, especially considering what had already been proven from the gospel records. <clears throat> Friends, there, I'm not aware of, and maybe someone smarter than me, no first century historians testify to the contrary. No first century historians claim to have found the body of Jesus. If someone says they found the body of Jesus, this is over. But they haven't, never have, never will. There are no first century historians that say the tomb was not empty. I know of no first century historians that was there when the disciples claimed to have seen Jesus after his resurrection, and they discredit those claims. We have abundant historical proof of Christ's resurrection and no known denial in early history. You see, it wasn't until later whenever we started to say, well, I really don't want to believe this, so maybe it didn't happen. All the history around that time confirms it. The people who state that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is not true are a group of Gnostics. And they're from the early second century. They actually existed before Christianity. They came up with this idea that Jesus, uh, they call it the swoon theory. Uh, If you've ever heard of the swoon theory, it's this idea that Jesus simply fell asleep on the cross. Yeah, they shoved the spear in his side and they put him in the tomb and Jesus woke up in in the tomb and walked out. Thus, empty tomb. 
Now, I don't know if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, but if you have, the damage to his body, they say, is accurate of what took place. Flesh so ripped off, bones exposed before he was put on the cross. Then he was nailed to the cross for the long period of time and suffered and died. There is no way that he fell asleep. Jesus died. So the Gnostics, they were prominent. They were a heretical movement in the second century. Um, Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity uh, and that Christ was an emissary of the remote being. Their claim to fame is that they have esoteric knowledge, uh, gnosis, which enables them to get information from the spirit more than you and I can get. In other words, there are a group of people that claim they have a special revelation from God. Have you ever heard anybody say they got a special revelation from God and it's different than the word of God? That's not from God, friends. But they want you to believe that they're so much smarter than you and I are, that they've got it all figured out. They're more informed than the theologians. They have this great insight into the things of God. They're heretics. And they're not just the early century. They're alive in a well in the church today. Often you'll hear, hear people say, well, we're so much more advanced in our thinking than we were the early church. And so, you know, we know better than they did at the time. Doesn't that sound kind of good to the ear, though? To be able to say I'm smarter and better and more intelligent than everyone else. You know, we teach our kids that. We want them to strive into academic excellence. We want them to get into all the special clubs and to show that they're more educated than we were. I mean, I wanted my kids to be more educated than me. Maybe you did too. But it feels good to find someone that says, you're special. You're more educated. The modern day Gnostics use that to recruit believers to their false thinking and to deter believers from speaking out. Nobody wants to speak if they're going to feel like they're, they're made to be stupid, right? We don't want to look stupid, so we keep quiet about our faith when others are detracting away from it. It's how they operate. It drives me crazy uh, whenever you look overseas and missions are exploding with, with salvations. They're, they've, they've just multiplied by so many. People come into Christ all the time. They're talking about sending missionaries to America. I bring them. We need them. We need a revival in America. But what they'll tell you is, well, they're, they're ignorant over there. They're not as smart as we are over here. Shame. It's just a shame. It's sad we've allowed people with questionable character to undermine the faith. So Tertullian, in order to fend off Gnosticism, he was a Roman theologian. He wrote um, a tome called Adversus Marcionum, which means against Marcion. It would stink for someone to write something against you, right? Against Rudy. That would really stink. Um, but this, this piece is a kind of a huge part of Christian history. And he built this case against the, the Gnostic sets, sect in kind of a, a lawyerly fashion. Uh, we know that Marcion taught that Christianity was a religion of love, which had no place whatsoever for law. Does that sound familiar? Love but no law? He taught that the Old Testament related to a different God and that the New Testament, this should sound familiar to you, the New Testament, well, I follow Jesus, not the Old Testament. We heard earlier that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. But if it's not in the red letters, then, then I don't follow it. Well, you're missing a lot, folks. God is a God of Old and New Testament. Marcion said that the Old Testament was uh, merely the creator of the world, that, that God was merely the creator of the world, and he was obsessed with the law. While the New Testament God was redeemed and redeeming the world, he was concerned with love. For Marcion, the purpose of Christ was to depose the God of the Old Testament, See, that's Gnosticism 101. That's what they want us to do. Tertullian, however, his thesis tore at the core of secular philosophies and showed that they were inconsistent with Christian theology. It didn't make sense. He stated that if these are used, then the integrity of the Christian faith will begin to erode. Now, is that prophetic? 144 AD, he says that if we will chip away at the idea that Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus is... More, more than the old. <clears throat> it's one of the most dangerous attacks on the church today. People, people who claim special knowledge 
gnosis, telling us that the God of the Old Testament is replaced with Jesus. The God of the New Testament, also that Jesus never fully died but swooned on the cross. Heresies. Inaccurate. So why is the resurrection of Jesus so important to us? First of all, it's proof of our salvation. If he resurrected, we're going to resurrect. Verse 3 of the Corinthians text, For I handed down to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul had been to the church at Corinth, and he had shared the gospel message with them. Their lives had actually been transformed, and they were standing on the promises of Christ's resurrection. You see, a dead Savior cannot save anybody, but a risen Savior changes everything. The second thing, the Old Testament scriptures are proof of the resurrection as well. The gospel message is important enough to share to all of mankind. We have got to share the gospel message. We've got to quit being afraid of it. And we've got to step out in this culture, in this society, and speak it. We do missions all the time, and I'm talking church overall. We do missions all the time, but do we share the gospel message in the midst of that? People need the living bread as much as they need real bread. People need the living water as much as they need a drink of water. We have to ensure that every single opportunity that we do missions is not just social work, rather it's gospel work, and that Jesus is shared We must be the hands and feet of Christ. Christ died. He was buried. He rose again. He was seen. Basic historical facts on which the gospel message stands. Now, Jesus died for our sins is the theological understanding of those historical facts. It's the why. Jesus did it for our sins and our salvation. When Paul wrote the words according to the Scriptures, he wasn't referencing the New Testament. It hadn't been written then. When he says that according to the Scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to the sacrifice of Christ as our substitute and our Savior. Leviticus 16 tells of the Day of Atonement. Isaiah 53 tells of the prophetic sacrifice. Those are just a few. There are hundreds of Old Testament references to Christ's sacrifice for us. The biblical and secular witness to the resurrection are the icing on the cake. You see, we are a resurrection people, and it changes everything. Now, when I preach funerals, I typically use Revelations 21, 1 through 7 as a text. Rare occasion I won't, if maybe the family doesn't want, they have something special they want. But it's really a picture of what the resurrection body will enjoy. And so it's a joy to share that in a funeral. Uh, So I want to share that with you today. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is where it gets good. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. Mm. That's the glory that we are working toward. That's the hope of our faith, our salvation in Christ. Wipe every tear from their eyes because there won't be a reason to have a tear. Wipe away pain. When's the last time you felt pain? Mine was this morning when my back said, wake up. (laughs) Ugh. No more death or dying. Are you sick of death and dying? Mm. Verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. For those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, that's the picture. That's eternity for us. Non-believers, that's not what you're going to enjoy. Jesus made it clear, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the key. For those who believe we're getting a new body, hopefully that looks better than this one. (laughs) 
Won't know till the day comes, right? But we'll get a new body. We'll experience the heavenly city. The resurrection is a central point of our faith. No resurrection, no Christianity. Friends, this is another non-negotiable of our faith. We have to push back on the Gnostic belief that somehow they've got it all figured out because they're so much smarter than we are. We've got to buckle down on our eternal truths of God's holy word. The second part of the Trinity, the word of God, the incarnate Christ, whose resurrection is proof of our future resurrection into the kingdom.